Welcome to Kidney Cancer Unfiltered. I'm your host, Anna Maria Scotcha. Today, we're talking with Sid Sadler about how social media can be a lifeline after a cancer diagnosis. Sid shares how he turned to TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook for support and resources, and how connecting with others online has helped him find comfort, even through humor. Whether you're newly diagnosed or a long-term survivor, this episode will show you the power of building a community online. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get started. Well, Sid, thank you so much for joining us on the Kidney Cancer Unfiltered podcast. In case um, people haven't had a chance to read your story on the KCA blog, why don't you introduce yourself and share a little bit about what brings you to this particular episode? Yeah, so uh, I want to thank you guys for having me on. Uh, this is this is awesome. I've uh, for those of you that don't know, uh, my name is Sid Sadler. I'm from Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, I am 32. About to, I'll be 33 at the end of this month. Um, so uh, I was diagnosed with uh, stage two kidney cancer. Uh, officially diagnosed in March, but my my tumor was found back in early December. Uh, my tumor was right around 10 and a half centimeters, so it was fairly large. And uh, I went through surgery on February 19th of 2024, so still fairly recently. And um, with that came my diagnosis of stage two, grade two clear cell renal carcinoma. So um, after that, I kind of have a background in communications, uh, nonprofit management, social media, all that kind of stuff. And after getting diagnosed, I kind of was at this pathway of what do I what do I do? Um, do I kind of try to forget it? A lot of my doctors that I had, great doctors, I was very lucky to be seen at Vanderbilt in Nashville. Um, a lot of them encouraged me to kind of just go on and live my life, which I am attempting yeah. to do currently. <laughs> um, but I also kind of found that as I was talking to other patients, um, ones that maybe hadn't gone through surgery yet or just gone through surgery, looking for advice, looking for people to talk to, especially people that are around my age or what's considered young for kidney cancer. Yeah. Um, I found that connecting with those people, starting to get into patient advocacy really um, did wonders for me, not only in just my recovery, but my mental health. I found that it was really starting to um, to help that. So that's kind of where... I'm here at the moment, right? I haven't even been a year post-diagnosis. Um, and, uh, I have tried to just dive headfirst into advocacy, learn as much as yeah. I can about uh, not only clear cell, which is what I was diagnosed with, but other types of kidney cancer um, and a, a lot of things in that realm. Um, I just taught just a perfect example. I was connected with somebody this past week who was getting surgery. Uh, today's Friday. So get, yeah. got surgery yesterday and FaceTime with them for a little bit on like what to expect and different things and this and that. And um, they have a very great outlook, but still going into surgery is very scary. Yeah. So yeah. Um, yeah, so that that's kind of where I came about with the KCA and, and trying to figure out ways in which I can get involved and advocate for patients. And so with that, I think because for the listeners, this is an episode on social media. Um, what was the role that social media played as particularly in those early days, whether it's before, like before, even before the diagnosis. So I, mm -hmm. I know we talked a little bit about how social media had helped with you with kind of coming to terms with it, but did you turn to social media first when they found the tumor or after diagnosis? Like when mm -hmm. did that start for you? So when, <sighs> If I can remember, I think I think my tumor was found on a Thursday or, or a Wednesday. I can't remember. And that night, um, as like I said, I'm 32. So as, as any millennial does now, uh, yeah. we go on Google, we go on social media, uh, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. And uh, I'll give a little shout out here. The first person that I ran into, I, I went to TikTok and I typed in kidney cancer. Um, and the first thing that popped up was uh, Katie Coleman. Yeah. And Katie Coleman uh, popped up and I was like, she's around my age. She has kidney cancer. Let me message her. I didn't even know, obviously, at the time that obviously she has a little bit rare presentation. We had different diagnoses. Yeah. The point was she has kidney cancer, a larger tumor like myself. She's my age. Let me reach out. So I reached out to her and, you know, she gets tons of messages and, and she's involved in so many things. It took a day or two for her to reply back to me, but with her reply kind of set off this 
almost this roller coaster in my a good roller coaster in my yeah. head of where can I start finding information? What are reliable sources to find information? Um, as I've learned, especially with kidney cancer, but with a lot of cancers, Google is not necessarily the best place to get information. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, a lot. A lot of the research, and it's not, I don't want to say it's a bad place. It's not, you can find valuable information, but a lot of the studies, a lot of things are, um, they're not, they're backwards looking. They they yeah. look at a lot of things that have had happened, um, but they don't look at current trends and treatments and how that's affecting kidney cancer. And at the time, I didn't know I was, I, I just assumed I was stage four, grade four, yeah highest aggressive cancer ever. I had five months to live type of thing, because I think that that's what most people do when they find out that they have cancer. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Automatically worst case scenario. So I started to look at other avenues to get information, um, whether it be Facebook or Instagram. So TikTok kind of started that. And there are not a lot of folks on TikTok that are doing what Katie does for kidney cancer. I know that there are people on Instagram um, and on Twitter or, or X or whatever you call it. And um, in Facebook, there's obviously some valuable Facebook groups to go on to. So that kind of, I, I was filtered into some of these Facebook groups. Um, and, you know, I have a love-hate relationship with Facebook. <laughs> yeah. it, it is uh, what I consider a necessary evil. Um, uh, even though I work in social media, I have seen the worst of the worst on Facebook. Yeah. But I've also seen um, these patient groups where people legitimately find connection and meaning and they find valuable information whether that's for their mental health or if it's for a new and upcoming treatment or so and so knows this doctor why don't i get you in touch with them and that i think is invaluable um 30 years ago that wasn't the case right yeah. 30 years ago you were pretty much stuck with your doctor or your treatment team and it was up to you to kind of do the traveling or calling and phone books and stuff. And that's just not the case nowadays. That's where this, this role of social media is kind of played. So I would say it started on TikTok and along with Katie and me talking with her, she kind of pointed me to some groups. And that's kind of how I started to see little windows where I could kind of place myself to help people, if that made sense. Oh, that makes total sense. Um, I, off of that, I wanted to really dig into the ways in which social media helps people that people may not actually realize, right? Like going to the whole necessary evil of Facebook, people just think of social media as either an area you doom scroll or you get misinformation, which are also very two, two true things about social media. But um, as you've pointed out in many different ways, like there is a way in which social media connects us that I don't think people realize, particularly for like the cancer community, whether it's kidney cancer or any other cancer. Let's just dig into that a little bit more. Yeah, so I think Facebook, we could use Facebook as an example because Instagram, TikTok, uh, X or Twitter. So with those other social medias, there's not really a group platform for people yeah. to congregate and and, and, and what I, you know, misery loves company, right? Yes. So there's not a place to do that necessarily. Um, but in Facebook, there's this unique feature that's been around forever where you can have groups and some groups are ran by administrators and others are ran um, by organizations such yeah. as uh, KCA has their own Facebook group. Um, I know uh, like KCC Cure has a Facebook group as well. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of other Facebook groups ran by organizations. And what's valuable about that is you not only have the ability to connect with other people and and share your story, which I think share, regardless of if you want to get into patient advocacy, I think the ability to share your story out there is cathartic in itself. Yes. Um, yeah. It's very, very cathartic um, to do that. I would encourage anybody to do that, even if they're not, even if they want to just go on and not necessarily be involved with um, their cancer journey or, or, or treatment or whatever, if they just want to kind of live their lives, which is perfectly normal and fine. Um, being able to share that story to other people that automatically understand what you're going through yeah. is, is invaluable. Um, I, this is a perfect story. This isn't necessarily social media, but it, it's the idea of um, understanding between two people. I was at one of the nonprofits that I worked for. I was over there on Monday at the office 
and a woman was coming by to pick up, uh, we, we have a food pantry there and a woman was coming by to pick up uh, some food and we were, we were just chatting. I didn't mention I had had kidney cancer or anything. And she said, I'm just getting over an eight year battle with breast cancer and I have mm. no evidence of disease and I'm feeling great. And right then and there, I was, I, 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 I felt a connection without saying anything without knowing where this woman comes from, <laughs> what her politics are, what her religion, anything. There's an automatic yeah. connection. Um, and I think that that happens in these groups. Everybody understands um, the playing field that we have all been put on. And other some people are at first base, some people are at second, third, some people at home plate, some people are in the outfield, but we're still all on the same playing field. So I think that that is where the value comes in these groups. And that's not to say uh, that there can't be misinformation or yeah, I'm, of like, course. I, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, but there are instances where there can be some harmful information or bots, you know, these things, yeah. these bots or people come in and talk about radical cures or how sugar can cause cancer and all these things that you, that's not valuable to the conversations that's happening on these groups. So um, that's what I have to say about that. I, I think Facebook groups are very valuable. Um, uh, but I always tell people to err on the side of caution too. to not, um, you still have your team, you still have your doctors. Um, it's a collaborative effort. It's not a one or the other effort. Yeah. And I think the great thing about um, social media and groups in general, to, or groups rather, is that it allows you to connect with other people that maybe you could take it out of the group, right? Now, not everyone mm -hmm. necessarily does groups like they're not. I'm one of those people who, while I'm part of those Facebook groups, I'm not a group person. It's just not, a, I'm not into support groups. It's just who I am and how I heal. Um, mm -hmm. but it's put me in contact with people, right? Like it's been, I've been able to get into contact with people on social who I would never see. Like Katie is the only person who lives in Texas, right? Like she's the only survivor I know who lives like an hour outside of me versus, um, uh, well, I should say her and John, like those are the only two I know yeah. in, in Texas, John Farrell, for people who are listening. Uh, he was on season one. If you want to go listen to his episode, just a little plug there. But, um, you know, you don't ex it's not exactly like we can go around um, and 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 just find a kidney cancer <laughs> person. So like those groups allow you to like connect with people on one on one too, like and take it kind of yeah. out of there and be like, all right, now you are going to be my person or you're going to be my people. Um, right. And go forth. But yeah, it's also that human connection. You can, that human experience, a common human experience where you, you can, you can even connect with other people who may not have the same cancer as you, but may understand because of age or whatever it may be. Um, but I'm rambling. I actually wanted to go into something else that's related to social media in terms of mm -hmm. connection and finding people. So the piece you wrote for the KCA centered around men and mental health. And I just wanted to know, how are you leveraging? I've seen you share that piece on your socials, which by the way, listeners, that's actually how Sid and I connected was on threads, <laughs> which is Instagram's answer to um, what we are calling Twitter. Um, but you, I've seen you share it on social media. Um, what, how has, and I know you're very focused on like raising awareness around men's mental health. So how have you been able to leverage yeah. social media um, to address that particular issue within the cancer community, like kidney cancer community or cancer community at large? Yeah. So um, when I first went on social media and looked at kind of the landscape of who is sharing and who is speaking and who's speaking out, and um, I noticed something really in particular, and this was not just on one platform, this was on multiple platforms or even on websites where people can share their stories. It was usually and I preface this by saying it's not always because people are like, yeah. well, well, I shared my story and that's, but when you would break down the numbers, it would usually be uh, women that were sharing their stories or their journey, or it would be women who are caregivers for men that are diagnosed with cancer or in this case, kidney cancer. And um, I kind of started to notice that. So I've been a big proponent of, of, mental health since I was really out of high school, going into college, um, and just realizing that there was not enough people talking about it. Um, and there was not enough people saying that, like, it's, it's okay sometimes to not be okay. Um, mm -hmm. Like, it is very much 
uh, we don't talk about that and we don't say that enough. And with men, uh, you kind of grow up hearing like, eh, whatever, like shake it off. Uh, it is what it is. Um, and I think you can do that sometimes in life as, as men and it is what it is and you kind of grow through it. But when you get a diagnosis um, like this, you start to do a lot of, um, of uh, internalizing. You start to take inventory of yourself mm-hmm. and how you're feeling um, and a lot of things. And you really give away the ability to um, feel okay and trust your body and trust your mental health. It, it's a, if for anybody that has been diagnosed with cancer or any type of chronic illness in general where it's harder to trust your body, um, it's just a whirlwind of emotion. So I started to notice that there wasn't a lot of men out there speaking. Now yeah. I have met a ton of now, ever, actually, ever since I posted that article, I have now met probably five or six men that have like messaged me or emailed me or whatever. And been like, Hey, like I want to connect. And I'm like, this is awesome. This is great. Um, and that's never to say, like, I think sometimes it's, it comes off as or uh, me being like, I don't want to talk to women or I don't want to no, talk to no, women yeah. about my problems, right? Like I have no problem talking to anybody, but I noticed that a lot of men just would maybe post once and then they wouldn't, they would never post again, or they would admit that things are hard, but they would never really um, like try to digest those feelings and go into those feelings. Um, and, you know, I've been seeing the same uh, therapist for now, like five or six years. And I've got very lucky that even after my di- I was seeing her during my diagnosis. Um, but I've encouraged people and, and men in general that, you know, if they get this diagnosis and they find themselves, you can obviously talk to your doctor about different ways to navigate that. But a lot of these cancer centers have people on staff that are literally there for this reason. Um, yeah. These are resources that you can take and um, just as a perfect example, at Vanderbilt, there were there were places in which I could reach out for help if if I wanted help. And at the time, I, I had the therapist that I had, and I, I loved her, and she's she's great. And I didn't need that at the time. But there are a lot of men out there that aren't seeing therapists, yeah. or aren't talking to people. Um, so that's where I kind of found that that void, right? And I don't think it's a um, you know, people in general, some people don't want to talk. And I, I don't think that that's a, a bad thing because people heal and process things differently. I don't want somebody to feel as if they have to share, but I do know because I am a man that it, it can be a challenge at times. And you feel like sometimes it can fall on deaf ears or it makes you less of a man and, that's just that's just simply not the case. Um, it's just yeah. it's it's not true. And if there are people in your life that think that those those are toxic situations that probably should, yeah, be dealt with uh, in in that manner. So that's where I saw that void. I, I saw that, and I wanted to um, the the diagnosis only kind of magnified that. It was already yeah. something that I was a little bit focused on before my diagnosis, and then I started to see that. Um, And I'll, and I'll say, I'll take it kind of one step further that I would notice that, um, you know, kidney cancer notoriously is something that affects uh, folks that are in their sixties, seventies. It's a little bit, you don't see a lot of people our age with kidney cancer. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So, but I would notice that a lot of older men were more adequate at talking about their, their feelings and what they're going through and how tough this diagnosis can be. Um, But men, my age, thirties, 40s. Um, there weren't a lot of them out there speaking. And that could be a, a thing where obviously not as many people my age are out there. But still, I would find that men that are a little bit older, are a little bit more um, able to conceptualize those feelings and, and talk about them. Yeah, I mean, there's a certain stigma attached, right, to speaking about mental health. And I think it's sure. particularly pronounced for men, for people of color, I think even for women, but right. to a certain extent, I mean, I'm I'm 10 years older than you. I'm, you know, still young and um whatnot. Mm-hmm. But growing up in the 90s and the early 2000s, like there was that whole Prozac Nation, a girl interrupted kind of vibe that, you know, made it okay, right? Or like allowed this it to be more okay for women to speak up, which is I think why you kind of see or partly why you see more women talking. So I think to your point about people thinking you don't want to speak to women, I 
it doesn't come across that way, at least to me. And I think, you know, most people, because we know that there's a particular stigma attached to men speaking out, right? Um, right. So I think it's great that you're leveraging social media. And to your point about people, not everyone may be feeling comfortable wanting to talk. Um, I think even just you talking, right? Like you using social media and opening your mouth and saying what is on your mind and, and bringing this issue forth and bringing awareness, I think is probably really helpful to so many people who might see it, may not be in a space where they want to be vulnerable with social media, but like reading and go, you know what, it's okay. So even if I'm not sharing it on social media, but maybe I feel okay enough to share it with my partner, to my my spouse or to my family and to my kids. So um, right. I just wanted to, I wanted to throw that out there that like, <laughs> we get it, right? I like, appreciate it. Yeah. Cause there's, I mean, there's that stigma and I wanted to talk to you about like breaking down that's I mean you touched on it right but it's like breaking down that stigma using social media you know what what are some things that have come out of you talking about your story I know you said you connected with someone recently and you spoke on FaceTime right. but what are some other ways you speaking out and being a patient advocate have you know on social media connections made and you know one of the things that I started to notice when I was speaking to pay when I was speaking to patients or even some caregivers or people in general in this space. Um, I had a ton of anxiety as with anybody. I had a ton of anxiety going into surgery. I just automatically assumed that I was going to die on the table and that I was going to have a, a d diagnosis that was just no coming. I had all these assumptions, right. Yeah. And um, after my surgery, and when I started to delve deeper and deeper into talking to people um, through social media, through other platforms, um, it really helped me coming to terms with that post, um, post surgery, post diagnosis life. Right. Yeah. I think when you go through this, a lot of people say that the worst part of this whole thing is the not having a plan. You 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 know you have cancer, but you don't have a plan yet, or you're waiting for surgery. And those are the worst times. And then you have this, like you have the surgery or if you have treatment before surgery or neoadjuvant therapy before surgery, et cetera, yeah. you have this time where it's, the, that's like the toughest time. And then afterwards you're just kind of expected to go live a normal life. Yes. <laughs> you're yeah. just expected to like go hang yeah. out and, and you had this large tumor on your, or just tumor in general, you had your kidney removed or half your kidney removed. Um, and you know, I love my doctors, my doctor, I, I really am lucky to have the doctors I have, but my doctor was like, yeah, just go home and forget you saw me basically. And I was like, ah, uh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that's going to work necessarily. And I understand where they are coming from in saying that, um, because they have a special, they're, they're, they're specialists, they're experts. I, I should take comfort in hearing that. And I do a little bit, but I found my brain kind of wandering, like, where can I put that effort, that stress, that anxiety, where can I put all of that kind of energy um, and effort into? And that's where reaching out to people and starting to talk to people kind of came to fruition. And I found that that helped my anxiety really tenfold. Um, so it's not always coming from a, um, from a place of I'm just trying to help myself. I genuinely do. Yeah love helping others and I do like my my back my degree is in nonprofit management so I've always loved being involved in the community and, and helping others I think that that is literally necess it's it's uh, necessary for I feel like as a people to survive to have those functions those nonprofits those places that help people um so but that's what I found one of the biggest things was it was just helping my anxiety and helping yeah. me kind of navigate those feelings. Cause I keep getting reminded by other folks that I've talked to that are a little bit more seasoned in their, their journey or their diagnosis or what have you, uh, that I'm still fairly early on in my diagnosis. Um, so it's, you know, it's not even been a year, so I'm still digesting yeah. feelings and digesting things. Right. Yeah. And as I mean, as someone who's been going four years on a journey, it still takes time. Like I, to your point, right? Like, I think particularly when you are younger, you often hear, I know I've heard it. A lot of survivor friends I know heard it. You see it where it's like, okay, you're young. 
Um, it was, it was not a stage. You're fine. Just go live your life. You'll be okay. But <laughs> at, cancer doesn't end after the treatment ends, right? Like there is all the feelings that come around with it because cancer is scary. Even if, mm -hmm. you know, the prognosis is, prognosis is good, it's still scary. And right, right now, only 5% of cancer survivors who need help, mental health help is only receiving it. And it's like about upwards of 75 who, who say they, they need it and they want it. And I don't know if you mm -hmm. guys heard that bang, but I was very passionate about that point. So if you <laughs> did, that is why you heard the bang. Um, so I think like even going broader beyond like mental health, men's mental health and stigma, I think just social media gives people that peer support opportunity. And I think you're, you're part of that, right? Like you're part of that that peer support. But I will say the anxiety might get less over time, but it never actually goes away. Right. You just, right. Just <laughs> uh, but, no, I... <laughs> no, no, go on. Yeah. Totally respond to that. No, I'll take a coffee no, break no. while you do. I, I, no, I, I agree. And, you know, I just was watching um, the, uh, there was a, um, there's a symposium happening uh, right now um, and uh, for kidney cancer patients. And they were just mentioning studies that were being, and I listen, I am not a doctor. I will butcher this to death, but they yeah. were just talking about uh, studies that need to happen for patients. Um, and they were looking at outcomes uh, with patients that were um, depressed, mm -hmm. anxious versus patients that were depressed and anxious, but were getting treated for those symptoms. And um, the outcomes seem to favor folks that are actively getting treatment. Yep. for those symptoms um, or that do not have those symptoms due to treatment, et cetera. Um, so it's not just something that like we talk about and it just is what it is like, okay, this, like this could honestly, and, and I don't know the numbers, I don't know the science behind it, but um, being able to get a handle on those things can, can help your, your treatment. Um, I mean, yep. it, it, they, they are looking at studies for that. So um, I think that that's just another factor and another reason why people should be, um, if they haven't at least and it, and it, does, again, it doesn't have to be you going out on social media to your followers or friends or whatever, and saying all these things, it could be as simple as talking to your partner. Uh, it could yep. be something as simple as talking to your, a trusted family member that you have uncle, aunts, and whoever, um, or it could be going to a therapist, psychiatrist, et cetera. Um, it does not have to be going out on social media and being like, I have these problems, X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. It yeah. doesn't have to be that at all. And it doesn't have to be public. Like, even if you do go on social media, it doesn't have to be public, right? You could just, right. D like you did with Katie, you could just DM someone and be like, hey, Correct. you are my source because this is what I have. And, you know, any <laughs> help is great. And I mean, I've made so many connections with people that way because they'll just reach out um, as as listeners should know or probably know by like my my specialty as an advocate is fitness and kidney health. And I've had so many people reach out to me in a DM. They're not necessarily public on their own story, but just reach out and be like, hey, finding your blog or seeing your post or whatever has helped me so much. And now I feel better. So it's yeah, like- I reached out to you. Yeah, yeah. And we had like a really like, we had a great like hour long conversation about fitness, nutrition yeah. and kidney health. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so many ways in which social media, I think, just really helps fill that gap when it comes to depression, mm -hmm. anxiety. And I'm trying really hard not to soapbox on that because I have done like research into those numbers. And it is true. People who do not who have cancer related depression, and anxiety, who do not get treatment are more likely to die from cancer related conditions and illnesses. So we mm -hmm. do need more of that therapy out there just just to make that that point. Um, but shifting gears away from mental health and just social media and <clears throat> advocacy in general, what is your advice to people facing kidney cancer who may who want to leverage social media um, both as a patient and as an advocate? Like what 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 would be your top three pieces of advice? Um, so I would say the so my first <laughs> the first thing is j just just do it. If, if that's if that's something that you're thinking about, um, there is there is no book. There, there's not a book out there that you can like read and be like, oh, I can do this. If you're already thinking about doing this, you probably uh, are in the right mindset and have the ability mm -hmm. to, to do something like that. 
Um, so that would be my first piece. Don't don't like you don't have to be a, you don't have to have a million followers. Like nobody care. I don't care yeah. about followers. I have zero, like there, I'm not getting paid from doing this. My second piece of advice would be don't, don't worry about um, like the followers necessarily, because when you're dealing with, if we're talking just kidney cancer, I think the numbers are something like 80,000 people, 80 to 83,000 people will be diagnosed with kidney cancer uh, this year of those 83,000 people. I'm sure at least half of them have social media, but then it's like how many of those people are active versus inactive and how many of those people are actually like social media literate, yeah. you know? So I don't worry really about the numbers. I worry more about the connections of people and I could have five followers, but if all five of those followers are interconnected with me and talking with me and speaking with me, checking in and I'm checking in with them, that's all I care about. I, I, yeah. it's not a, it's not a, it's not a money thing or a follower thing. Um, and also my, like my, my third piece of advice would be to figure out exactly where you fit in, into that space. So not only just like, if you take social media and, and cancer or kidney cancer specifically, yeah. Um, I found that my coping mechanism was humor. Um, some people love dark humor. Some people do not. Um, some people don't really have an opinion on it. Um, I found that it helped me tremendously. I already kind of had a, a, a dark humor uh, <laughs> love before. Um, and that's, you know, my, my, uh, uh, my mom, unfortunately, she passed away back in 2019. And her and I would always love dark humor together. So even since she passed, like it, it's it's a thing that I utilize to cope. So that's where I found that I could bring the most joy to people. Um, I, I since since I've since I've kind of been advocating that way and trying to um, navigate that, I haven't had anybody reach out to me and been like, "Oh, that's I hate this" or yeah. "That's not good." Like I would find most cancer patients genuinely uh, like some humor in their lives because they're looking for things to laugh about. They're looking for things yeah. that they can not only laugh about, but relate to as well. Um, so find your niche. It could be um, more on the research side of things. It could be um, like our great friend, Katie, she wrote a book. It could be yeah. writing a book. There are multiple avenues to get involved in. Um, and I would say the, the, that third piece is just figuring out where you kind of want to get plugged in. And I would say a fourth, fourth, um, I, not just three, not limited, four, not limited. God, like the whole world would be uh, would be to get involved with organizations like KCA or um, uh, other organizations that deal with uh, kidney cancer because that's where you're going to find you're able to not only get resources for yourself um, that you might not have known about but also be able to filter people to those resources because yeah. you can only give so many people, you can only give so much to people before you're like, okay, I should refer you here or this place has great resources um, or how to navigate things because navigating a diagnosis is like rocket science. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I do yeah. not recommend it. I have learned how to read pathology reports now. I have learned the different um, forms of aggressive kidney cancer and what the grades mean, what the stages mean, what the different features mean. All of those things uh, I would not have been able to to understand uh, without organizations like KCA or people that I've found online that are other advocates. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that would be my fourth. That would be the, the number four. <laughs> so going back to the dark humor though, we would I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the unremarkable kidney. So I feel like one thing, yeah. <laughs> I think I feel like one thing I noticed when um I was first diagnosed is that we have a propensity to, and I didn't say that word right, but we're gonna go with it, um, to name our kidneys or or have like some type of humor. Like my, my I got a plushie. Um, a kidney plushie when I was diagnosed. So the the one that's pained is named Jake. That's the bad kidney. That's my left kidney that's gone. And the other side that's happy is Kevin. And like I know people have like named their their like tumors or their kidneys. And so so humor is a thing that we like apparently. But I want you to talk yes. about your social account, not your personal one, the one that you had come up with that really does lean on humor and it's a great one. I can't I can't go without you talking about it and promoting it. Right, right. Um, so I decided, so I, 
I went through a couple of different variations um, of like what I wanted to, how I wanted to navigate this. Um, and I kept seeing on pathology reports, unremarkable, unremarkable, unremarkable. And I feel like that's so ironic because when you hear unremarkable, you're just like, that means it's not special. Like that yeah. means it's not good or whatever. Um, so given that I have, I, I don't know what I would have called myself if I had maybe a partial nephrectomy because I don't, it would be the unremarkable kidney and a half or something. I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, but I have one kidney, so I decided to lean on that and th thank God it was not taken, um, because you go through this process of trying to figure out names yep. <laughs> and, um, with that, I really, really love just leaning on actual experiences that I've had. Um, if you're listening to this, you likely have either been diagnosed, unfortunately, with cancer, or you know somebody that has been diagnosed with cancer, and you have had these conversations or <laughs> interactions with people, whether it be in person, online, or with yourself scrolling through my chart or waiting for a, a message from your oncologist or your doctor or your urologist. Um, and I wanted to kind of bring that to fruition because there are yeah. people out there that have um, accounts that deal specifically with research or talk about um, uh, different things with patient advocacy and different avenues to get involved, but I didn't see like a ton of humor there. Yeah. There are humor accounts out there. Like I'll tell you one, uh, the, uh, what I think it's called the cancer patient, um, great humor account for, uh, just generalized cancer. Yeah. Um, and then there's, uh, Oh, you're so tough. I'm sure you've heard yes, of, Oh, I oh love you're so, oh, tough. so tough. Yeah. Um, awesome account. And I've actually talked with her um, just in general about social media and what have you, but there was no like kidney cancer one. And I was like, I, I want that. Like, I want to have something to laugh at that deals specifically with urology and kidney cancer. Um, and I always found like my, my tagline is there is the youngest person in the urologist's office by 30 years, because whenever you go into the urology office, I feel automatically like the youngest person in the whole building mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't matter yeah. you do too even though you said you're 10 years older than me you definitely feel like the youngest person oh yeah in the no i'm too. definitely the youngest <laughs> and also the only one of my gender like anytime yeah, yeah anytime men. i've got into the urologist's <laughs> office it was just it was like me among a sea of older men which is still it, it's just when you are not like when you are not the common denominator it just it makes the experience harder because you don't have someone to turn to, but I'm glad you, I want mm -hmm. you to go back talking to it, but I'm glad you picked it up. Like our Katie and I's friend, Kayla, we, she and I had tried to do a humor account when we were first diagnosed. That was like four years ago called coffee with chromies. It didn't take off, but I un like, we did it I because we, un yeah, we understood like that. You're right. There isn't necessarily that humor based account for kidney cancer because there's some things you hear i'm sure you heard it too it's like well at least you have two it's like sure okay and it's like sometimes yeah. you just kind of have to laugh at at that stuff but <sighs> to interrupt <Yeah>. you <laughs> please go on. no you're good you're good yeah well and i, I want to like i also want to say too like these accounts um whether it be mine or other uh, at least at least how i view it a lot of the times people will say these things and they don't come from a malicious point necessarily. Not. It's not like a thing where now I, I'm, I don't want to speak for every single thing. Um, but like, if somebody's like, Oh, well, like you have, you got one good kidney. So like, that's good. Like I understand what they're saying, but it's still one of those things where it's like, yeah, but I also like lost one and I could have cancer again. It depends on what happens. <laughs> so um, I I do like take that into consideration. And I always tell people that, that it's not a, I'm not necessarily making fun of the person as much as I am making fun of the idea yeah. um, that the person is saying. Um, so with that, like I've, I've definitely find, I, I found that to be, cathartic because humor to me is is seriously one of like I will I will sit on my phone and I work in social media so having to go from what I do in in my professional life to utilize that in my patient advocacy life or line um it was very seamless and I'm very thankful for that because not everybody is 
social media literate or knows how to navigate those things or kind of leverage the experience that you have with one organization and take that experience and utilize it for your patient advocacy or or however you want to do that, whether it be humor or research, education, et cetera. Um, I found that I'm very thankful for that, that I have that background because not everybody does. And it's, um, uh, like speaking about Katie, you know, Katie didn't have a social media background. She was yeah, very much yeah. in a different field, but started it. And her story was so riveting that it picked up. Um, and I've even gotten tips from her because even though I work in social media, um, she's, you know, she really rocketed with her, uh, with her TikTok. So I've even gotten tips from her. Um, so yeah, that's, that's what I, I would say that the dark humor has definitely, um, that's like probably 85% of what's on that account. Uh, the yeah. other 10 to 15% are educational things or symposiums I know about or things, uh, resources from KCA and, and other things like that. Because it's still important to do those things. It's not, I, I don't want to just, because if somebody's looking at the account, I don't want them to feel like they can't get any valuable information from the account, right? Yeah, I want them to be able to laugh, but also get other things too. Yeah. So wrapping up, I have a, a I have three things. One, do you have any last <clears throat> idea? So you can answer this all in like one long rambly answer. So <laughs> the first one is, do you have any last thoughts that you want to share? Uh, two, other than Katie and the other two that you mentioned, who are some other people that anyone listening should reach out and follow? And three, where can people find you on social? Okay, so I gotta, I gotta, I gotta digest all this. Um, so <laughs> the okay, so the unremarkable kidney is my account on socials, and it's literally exactly how it sounds. There's no spaces or uh, weird exclamation points or numbers. It's literally just the unremarkable kidney, and that's on Instagram. It's also on Threads, but honestly, I don't do as many th- threads with that account. It's mostly just Instagram. Um, I don't, I don't foresee that changing over anytime soon. I think just on Instagram, that's the best place um, to find most of the advocacy work that I am involved in now. But if it ever changes, it will be posted on there on other ways to, to find things. Um, And then as far as advice I would give, or, or I guess closing thoughts, um, it like getting a, getting a cancer diagnosis at this age is is very weird it it's it's very um it makes you have a lot of those um what i call bathroom conversations that you don't want to have with people but you end up having to have because your life could change very quickly um and you have to learn how to take time for yourself um and and for the people around you too but you have to, you, you, it's very imperative that you learn how to take time for yourself and to digest the things that are happening in your life. Because it didn't really hit me that I had cancer and like I have been diagnosed with cancer until I got that final pathology report after surgery. Up until then, it was always like, yeah, you probably have cancer. It's probably clear cell. It's probably this, that, et cetera. But until I actually got like the final pathology report, I didn't really digest that I had cancer. It was just, oh, it's something in me. Um, So being able to really feel those feelings and understand that like, this sucks, but there is an after, there is an after Mm -hmm. diagnosis and there are roads that you can take. As I've said, you don't have to go out and get into advocacy. You can live your life. Um, But I do think that if you do do that, it's still important that you share your story. And it it doesn't matter the way you do it. You don't have to go write a blog. I mean, I would say it's great if you want to do a blog for KCA, and I would highly recommend it. But you don't have to do that. You could simply simply just share it with a friend or share it with a relative for coffee one day or something. Um, And I think that that's very cathartic. Um, as far as other account, like I go through my accounts, um, on here on people that I follow and a ton of them, I I know I had mentioned Katie. I know I'd mentioned, Oh, you're so tough. Uh, the cancer patient. I don't, I'm sure you follow the cancer patient, right? Uh, yeah. Yeah. The the cancer patient is great. Obviously I follow KCA. Um, 
And those are really the main ones that I, I kind of look at when it comes to kidney cancer or cancer in general, because, oh, you're so tough. Um, and the cancer patient are, are more generalized um, humor when it comes to cancer, which still applies to kidney cancer, yeah. but there are like certain things when it comes to kidney cancer that are, people would find more humor in versus, uh, g- general. It's kind of funny how that works, right? It's kind of funny how the cancers are separated by humor and yeah. what they find funny and what they don't find funny. Like I, like for instance, I, um, I always see things about, uh, chemo brain and stuff. And like, yeah. I don't, I don't, I, that doesn't necessarily, I like from my understanding, it, chemo injections versus targeted chemo it's a little bit different on how that interacts so kidney cancer notoriously does not do well with regular uh, chemotherapy so not many kidney cancer patients fall into that realm (laughs) no but most of us turn around and look at our pee to make sure it's not foamy yes yes okay yeah that's a that's how we'll end this conversation i have never in my life looked at my pee more in the last six months than I have Mm -hmm. in my entire life. And it's not only that, but to make sure like there's no blood or anything like Mm -hmm. that. Like I will sit there and just look at it and be like, okay, yeah. Okay. I look hydrated and normal. We can flush now. We're good. Yeah. Yeah. I did. I did a reel on that. Um, I did a reel on that. Particularly like on like one kidney, like fitness people, like making sure there's like not protein there, but yeah, I have not looked at my urine. I have not been so concerned about my urine um, as I had in the last four years, like never before that. And like even smells like, it's just like, oh God, is that the asparagus or is there something wrong? Like, it's just, But yeah, like imagine being in your 30s and 40s, being that concerned with your urine because you only have one kidney because of cancer. Uh, But I think that's a great way to end this. Urine. Urine. I agree. That's what it's all about. (laughs) Well, thank you so much for joining me. You have a fantastic day. And thank you listeners for listening. Go follow Sid at The Unremarkable Kidney on Instagram, threads, and I think that's it. Just as Instagram and threads. I don't think you're on TikTok, right? That's it. You're right. That's it. Awesome. Thank you.